try to get on that. I will go ahead and share, uh, start recording. Again, this is mainly for those folks that may not um, be able to join us. And share my slides. All right. Uh, so here we go. And, and I'll have to say again, uh, before I, I begin, I think I've said this to, uh, I, I start almost every session with this, that this is a, it's a workshop. Um, you know, I'm sure that you all have been at workshops before. This is going to be a 45, 50 minute workshop. Um, I always uh, value and encourage people to chat, to share, either verbally raise your hand, physically raise your hand, uh, virtually with the icon, put something in the chat, however you'd like to communicate. But I do realize that uh, in 50 minutes, there's not a lot we could do. So I see this as actually more of a, a commercial or a, a context to start to build a conversation. So if there's not a lot of interaction, I understand that. Uh, some of these concepts may be new uh, to you. And so I'm gonna walk through and do kind of a lecture. Uh, I'm, I'm not, I typically don't do lectures when I teach undergrads and grads. And I definitely don't when we're doing some of our active uh, longer course design studios. Uh, but these Tuesday sessions are really gonna be about providing you some background and some research in some different ways that we think about teaching uh, in the hopes that you Think about these, process these. Maybe you kind of uh, delve a little further on your own or you share it with colleagues, uh, you know, open it up in your department meetings or recontact with me uh, and we can kind of share some specifics about how these might uh, apply and integrate into your uh, own teaching and your own classrooms. So with that, today's topic is gonna be about classroom methods and teaching strategies. Uh, this workshop summary that uh, hopefully you received from either the email blast or the uh, learning commons. They posted that on the reservation list for the learning commons out of the um, union campus, uh, which you can access online. But this is what we're going to kind of focus in on this concept of the uh, of Malcolm Knowles uh, andragogical approach. And many folks that I work with are a little surprised about that word. They they're unfamiliar with it. They haven't heard it. Uh, typically, we use the word pedagogy, and, and I'm not going to be picky on what word you use, but I think um, because we are in the business of adult learning, uh, I'm going to share with you the background and that particular model. And so these methodologies will be based on that model as opposed to kind of a theoretical pedagogical model. Uh, I will focus, hyper-focus, as I mentioned, I, I gave a, a, a workshop previously on active learning methods, and so I'll touch upon those. But I'd like to go deeper into the three concepts of uh, pace processing and sequencing. Obviously, we should think about some outcomes. The, the bottom line here, I'm hoping that uh, what the information that we share, that you're able to afterwards uh, integrate some well-aligned teaching methods. And you'll, you're probably getting tired of me talking about alignment, alignment, uh, whether it's alignment with your learning outcomes to your assessments, your outcomes to your methods, your outcomes to your technology, your outcomes to your program outcomes. Um, but I think sometimes people always ask the question, is it good or bad? Uh, and my, my question back to them is, you know, how well is it aligned? You know, what are your goals? Uh, what are your um, outcomes for the students? And if we really are intentional about how we align these, then typically positive things happen. I try to stay away from words like good and bad. Those are a little too relative for, uh, for myself as a kind of an empirical social scientist to, to measure. And so I like to measure what that might look like. And then I am going to introduce and kind of uh, tag along uh, Noel's andragogical approach. And you'll see with his six items uh, that he thinks of, that he kind of uh, proposes it in his model, I'll encourage you to think about how you connect uh, with those, how you help kind of scaffold student learning with those. Uh, one of the things that folks who have joined me, I, I really try my best. Um, I think it differentiates Centers for Teaching. It differentiates the kind of things uh, that, that I, I can share. Uh, everyone has their discipline-specific background and you're experts in, in your area. My background previously was chemistry, science ed, and, and now kind of pedagogy, andragogy. I always like to make sure that people receive some of this research. Now, you don't have to uh, review the research. Uh, you don't even have to really pay that much attention to it. I just want to make sure that you know that where I'm coming from, everything I do will be research-based. And it's it's an easy thing to say, but you'll notice that I have a lot of little parentheses, people's names and dates. 
uh, I often have folks that I'll overhear or they'll share this while they're having a conversation with others that, well, Jay said this and Jay said that. And it, the words will come out of my mouth. That's true. Uh, but I want to make sure that people know that, that I'm not actually saying it. I'm, I'm sharing the research of, of other folks who have done some really intensive research. So um, I, I start off right away with trying to share, you know, why would we think or even care about teaching methods? Why, you know, what's the effect of people who, who understand deep um, methodology of, of teaching, pedagogy, andragogy versus ones that maybe don't? And, and let's be honest, uh, very few of us have had formalized training in, uh, in teaching uh, through our programs. You know, we got our, our degrees in biology, philosophy, whatever it might be, and we're, we're experts in that area, but uh, maybe you went through a, a certificate or a short course as a graduate student, maybe not. Um, a lot of it is done kind of on the job the first year, and we may have picked up something, may have not, and we may be in our 10th or 20th year and still not quite sure about this, uh, this pedagogy, andragogy that uh, we've been doing. Uh, I find that some of the effective instructors uh, really embrace this because they've been doing it all along. They weren't sure why, they weren't sure of the research. They just found a way to, to connect to what really works. Uh, so this is the first kind of reason, and this is a lot of data. Again, you don't have to read it or understand it, but it's just basically background to support why uh, we believe that understanding and using a variety of methodology for teaching is, is gonna be really helpful to uh, influence student achievement. And in a nutshell, right, so teacher's estimate of student achievement, if you, if you think well and think high of students, they typically will meet those, um, those goals. Uh, the teacher uh, efficacy, so your own thoughts of your teaching ability, uh, if you believe that you can teach really well, then that's going to have an effect. Constructivist approach, we'll talk a lot about that during this session. Uh, the strategy to integrate prior knowledge, which is a part of constructivism, uh, but understanding that, uh, what it means how you access prior knowledge, how you assess prior knowledge, how you connect prior knowledge. This is all of these factors that are part of the methods that we select for teaching. Uh, transfer strategies, you'll hear me talk quite a bit about information processing, how we can help develop those processing skills so the students can extend and extrapolate those concepts. Chances are in this world, uh, probably always, our students aren't going to find exactly what you share with them during those, these sessions that we have, the very limited amount of time that we have. So we have to develop, uh, help them develop some ways when they meet new, similar events in their life, how they can extrapolate that information. And of course, scaffolding. So these are some of the major attributes uh, that you'll see that are built into uh, people who actually focus on uh, intentional methods. Uh, so I thought I would do a really quick uh, history lesson here. I apologize for this if you know this, but most people that I meet have not even heard of the word andragogy. Uh, you know, you can look at the, uh, the Latin derivative of this. Basically, you know, pedagogy means child learning, andro means adult learning. So there's nothing kind of fancy about this in that there are differences between adults and children, uh, a novice and experienced. Uh, none of us at, at our age of even 18 come to... Um, the, the class with a blank slate. We come with experiences. Something has happened in the first 18 to 20 years of our lives. And this is really what andragogy is all about. It's, it's been around for a while, you know, 1830s, somebody kind of thought, hmm, this is different. You know, people, uh, these aren't uh, young children who maybe uh, need uh, a little bit of background knowledge to start to make some connections. Uh, John Dewey came out and kind of pursued it and kind of let it go. And uh, in the 20s, I really like this and why I highlighted this is that uh, Rosenstock basically said, you know, he, he, they thought that adult education might require special teachers and special methods and special teaching philosophies. And I, I have to laugh because you know, this is kind of what I do uh, for a living. I try to help faculty who are, again, experts in their area um, help others become experts in, in their area. And uh, I think it does take a special, and, and that word special, what I mean by it is just somebody that's willing to uh, really consider and reflect and, uh, and take what we know about the research on how we teach, how we communicate, how we interact, and build that into who's in front of us. Uh, and, uh, and as you probably know, I, and I've talked about this in a previous session, is that thinking about um, who those students are, what are their backgrounds, maybe offering a pre-assessment, a baseline, an inventory, something that allows you to capture uh, who they are at that moment. We all know that, that students change year to year, decade to decade. So trying to figure out what that is that they know and then capitalizing on how you might connect to that. 
So that's kind of the background of where that is. I'll just jump right and try to get to this as quick as possible, uh, sharing the six major points of, of Noel's model. Um, it is this humanistic, right? It's, it's very connected to who we are. Uh, it is in trying to get people to be more self-regulated, more self-directed, and create what's called autonomous learners. I think we all know it, but sometimes we might forget that um, you know, we need to do and interact with students in a way that 16 weeks later, well, a semester later, a quarter later, that um, they can kind of do it on their own. And so that's a lot more than just delivering content. We have to find a way that they start to uh, be able to uh, ask the right questions and, and consider and reconsider and, and really document uh, what they're understanding. Uh, the first of six, uh, Malcolm's approach is that um, andragogy, adult learners uh, need to know why. They need to know why they're learning this. Uh, you may have thought back when you were uh, a younger or adult learner and starting to, to enter uh, college, sometimes people would have you take a class. Algebra tends to be pretty famous of the age old question, why do I need algebra? Um, the best answer that I've heard uh, from this is that it was uh, basically from an algebra instructor is that they try to basically share that it was it was a way of thinking, a way of really looking at life and, and life's challenges. And so find whatever it is that you would like, but you probably should help our students to know uh, why, you know, and a good solid reason uh, that aligns with their background and where they're going. <laughs> the one thing that may not work is if you always assume that they are going to be like you and they're going to end up getting a PhD and they're going to end up being a professor. Uh, very few of them uh, statistically will probably find that as a, a rational reason to learn uh, this concept at this point in their life. So you have to find a way to connect maybe uh, from that. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, most of our students uh, at, after 18 years on this planet um, have some sort of experience, some prior experience, some foundational experience. That's going to provide a basis for how they're able to connect. Um, you know, maybe they have had a broader experience. Maybe they have had a more limited experience. I grew up in a very small town in the Midwest of the United States. And so when I went to college, uh, which seemed like far away in, in, in Florida, uh, I didn't realize till I arrived that I had very limited foundational experiences and I had the kind of hustle to, to, to build some of those uh, background experiences. Uh, and so I'd encourage you to, to think about that and think about either how you're going to assess that. And the biggest thing is how you're going to be able to, to highlight to your students um, what they know, what they don't know, what they should know. And if they are kind of lacking in some of those then you might want to think about providing some supplemental uh, background information. I teach environmental chemistry quite often, and, and I, I can't teach them chemistry all over again. So I have to do a quick little background on what, what chemistry they recall, how they're able to use those. And if they're not able to, then I provide them some supplemental kind of on their own task uh, that they can try to uh, bring themselves up to speed. Uh, the concept, uh, the idea of self-concept, you know, students who are truly adult learners. They want and need to be responsible to be involved. You'll see that this really aligns well with one of our methodologies of project-based learning. Uh, but looking at a project, especially authentic projects with authentic assessments, uh, this, this really kind of kicks them into wanting to be involved uh, more and more. Um, their readiness, uh, their ability to be ready. I, I share with my students from day one that um, they applied to, to be part of this community. We kind of accepted them into the community. Uh, they, they should be interested in the material. They, you know, I don't, no one really forced them into going into the college or this major. And so uh, they should be ready for those things. And if not, then we might have another conversation about, about uh, redirecting uh, their readiness into some other form. Adult learners have a problem or a process or a project base rather than content. Uh, I know we all love our content and, uh, and we hope that they might be interested in our content, but, but they tend to have an orientation that is uh, process problem oriented and not as focused in on memorizing all the facts. Uh, I think that if you really reflect back, you probably got interested in your particular area, not because you were interested in facts, but because something just clicked and you really were interested in how those facts were connected and how they made sense uh, and how they just really were of interest to you. And so that's that orientation that we may wanna think about uh, with adult learners. And the last one that I think is one of the most important that I think people minimize a lot, it's a dispositional attribute of motivation. Most uh, adult learners are what's called intrinsic or internal uh, rather than external. The most popular extrinsic uh, factor that we have out there are grades. 
Uh, we think students are interested in grades. Uh, I will say that it certainly appears though it is, uh, but when I really have some deeper conversations with students, they're normal humans uh, and they react to things. Why would they be interested in grades? I don't think they were born or they wake up every morning uh, and this is their number one goal. They do it because uh, it's a driver in their life. You know, we society, institutions, graduate schools, we've made this a primary driver and we've kind of made them feel like that they need to have these grades um, to be successful uh, in life. And so I'm kind of hoping that we can minimize some of that. I, I tend to share with my students that if you truly get interested in something and truly care about something, you will, I won't say always, but most of the time, um, you'll earn the, a sufficient grade to keep you moving along uh, and you'll ultimately be successful. So that's the motivation behind that. So these are the six foundational um, concepts. I won't go through in detail, but I just always like to share that this isn't a standalone theory out there. Um, some of you may be familiar with Mizro's work, uh, Critical Theory of Adult Learning. Uh, all of these concepts address uh, th that particular aspects of um, adult learning. This is all just to provide further background um, that there is some really foundations uh, to this concept of andragogy and, and then hopefully thinking about that when you develop your methods, um, you start to, to integrate all of these into the methodologies that you're working so that we remind ourselves. And some people will, will say, some of my colleagues uh, will come back and say, well, you know, my students are still novice learners uh, and they, maybe they aren't as mature as we think they are. And, and there's a lot of rationality that we can think about those. But I think if, um, if we start to, to kind of have some expectations of who they are, how they'll behave, uh, humans in general, and definitely I find that our students uh, will actually meet that, that challenge. So interactive uh, andragogical methods, I'll, I'll just kind of share some of these again. You'll see uh, if you're kind of following along these workshop series, uh, inquiry-based, problem project, case-based discovery. Hopefully these have come uh, across your desk. And if you haven't delved into these yet, I'm happy to work with you individually to see how we can transition or migrate some of your current methodologies into these. Uh, I wanna be really clear and upfront that um, this is not easy. Uh, it's, it's not a, a time saver. It's, uh, there's really nothing about effective teaching that is going to um, make things easier, quicker for you. It, it will empower the students. It will completely take a different approach uh, to how students engage in the content, the material, the concepts, you, the world. But it's a challenge. Uh, I'm just going to be honest. It's a challenge. So if you start to do this, don't think that you're just going to sit back on a weekend and change all of your <laughs> teaching methods from, uh, you know, kind of traditional lecture base to uh, some of these. Uh, it's going to be uh, a little bit of a challenge, but, but not insurmountable. And I'm happy to help you with, with all of this. Uh, for the constructivists out there, obviously building upon prior knowledge through some connections and scaffolding. Uh, there's, a, there's a very deep foundation uh, in uh, interactive andragogy with constructivism. And, and really from, from Lao Tzu to, to Piaget to Dewey to Vygotsky, this, this is not a new concept. It's really spread across cultures. It's spread across time. This has been going on for true deep learning uh, for, for a long, long time. I think, unfortunately, we have artificialized our formal learning into schools and we pretend that this is not how humans connect and, and learn. So we try to do it in a very different way, a very efficient kind of factory based way. Uh, but I think that you'll find at, probably why you're on this uh, workshop is that that is, uh, is a little too shallow and uh, doesn't work for our students to help them really be successful in, in the future. Um, our role in this interactive andragogy is to actually create this climate so that all students can access uh, and collaborate and, and, and think about each other and, and peer learning each other and self-directed, self-regulated. And so uh, that sounds, again, kind of easy, but that takes a lot of planning, a lot of contingency plans, a lot of preparation to be able to create those kind of environments, which, of course, uh, we should be thinking about how we're going to balance uh, these things of lectures and discussions and visuals. Uh, with the pandemic and people migrating online, some people had to rethink some of that. Uh, I think now as we kind of go back to face-to-face -to -face and or hybrids, uh, hopefully that kind of a, an approach, uh, people are starting to think about how we can maintain some of the things that worked and maybe that didn't work as well. But ultimately uh, our goal along with this, uh, as far as being interactive is to think about questions, not just questions, but diverging questions. And I'll share a list of you uh, for you later in this um, 
session on Bloom's taxonomy that gives you some prompts to help with that. Uh, and kind of trying to think about how deeply we can go um, as opposed to on the surface. And, and I know there's this tendency, I, I'm, I'm guilty of it just as well as anybody, is uh, things that we have to cover and things that these concepts that we think they're important in our fields. Uh, I'm just going to encourage you to think about how you can organize your methods so that they, the students, uh, find their way to those concepts instead of you kind of sharing them in a linear way. Um, I also want to kind of remind us, I thought this was a good time to pause and kind of take a step back and, and recall that there's a lot of common elements when we think about effective teaching. And this could be whether it's online, offline, uh, pedagogy, andragogy, interactive, whatever it might be, there's a lot of common elements. Uh, the first one I, I, I love, and I just kind of touched upon this, is that there is um, more than just covering content. And I, you know, again, I, I hear this all the time. I, I get it. I, I understand why. Uh, we think about things that we have to cover. Um, uh, one of my most famous stories is I had a good colleague of mine teaching anthropology, and he came by my office after a class, and he was all excited because he was he was he had a you know a great lecture, and, and he was able to cover everything, and and he was you know had all the dates, and he was speaking well, and and he was just excited, and I I thought okay that's great I, I'm I'm that's super, and then I had to kind of uh, disappoint him a bit by my response was you know well what did the students do. Uh, and it kind of took him back a little bit, and he realized a little bit later that yeah, it was it was probably more about what they were doing and less about what we were doing. Uh, so this concept of not covering, but students uncovering or discovering uh, things, and so we we need to provide some venues so that they do a lot of that. We can kind of capture that and help move them along with that. Um, anytime we can kind of create and facilitate some sort of engaging environment. At the very last slide of today, I'll be sharing with you a large list of um, interactive teaching methods uh, that I shared at the last um, workshop as well on active learning that you can use in case you're not, you know, you don't have those on hand. Uh, lots of interactions. Effective teaching requires lots of interactions. I will share that could be during class, before class, after class. Um, this is the, the tricky thing, and it kind of came out with the pandemic when we talk about synchronous versus asynchronous. You know, what are we actually having students do between the times that we see them or virtually see them? And, uh, and this is key in our structure. It's key in, in Andrew It's key in our expectations. And obviously, timely, helpful, critical, formative feedback. You're going to see this as a repeated theme. Uh, again, this can be time consuming, but it can also be well worth it if it's the right time and the right kind of feedback, both for you and for your students. So this is the one slide that I did share uh, at the previous uh, active learning methods. Uh, maybe some of you recall this. I went into each one of these in detail, so I won't go into them now, but these are some really key models. There's other types of methods and models, but these are the ones that you might wanna think about uh, as, you're, as you're kind of planning of who, who you wanna be as a teacher, as you're, when you're writing your teaching statements, uh, when you're planning your courses and designing your courses, you probably want to pick a couple of these and, and create that as a, as a theme or a backbone. Uh, the first one, obviously, is under this category of information processing. I share uh, the graphic there. As you recall, I, I shared in detail how this works uh, with the, an earlier workshop on learning theories. Uh, but basically, right, where the, you know, the input in teaching, students are going to kind of sense this. They're going to process that with their short-term memory, working memory, hopefully, uh, connect it to their long-term memory, and then it will be there uh, upon appropriate prompts and cues if they've kind of got the coding and decoding in parallel. So inquiry, collaborative, and competency-based all kind of follow that pattern. Inquiry, as you uh, probably recall in the Socratic uh, method, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a session of, of question asking, but these aren't low-level, you know, what is your favorite color kind of questions. These are very divergent, higher-level questions and the real key of, a, of an effective inquiry-based uh, lesson is that uh, one question feeds into the next. And I know that I've been successful at it when I can step further away uh, from the class conversation and the students start to ask each other questions. I feel like that's when I've act actually been able to, uh, to provide that kind of, a, of an environment. Um, collaborative, uh, I think a lot of folks struggle with this and I hear a lot that uh, sometimes faculty try to do collaborative learning, but it doesn't work. Uh, I find that um, it is a challenge, but we, if we can organize it in a way, structure it in a way, especially if we can in, in, integrate some case base, some authentic cases, uh, collaboration can work, but it is a challenge. Uh, again, this is why we tend to, to defer to some lecture base because that's, uh, that's less of a challenge. 
and competency-based. This has become popular with online learning. I'll share a slide with some distinct attributes of competency-based here in about two slides. Uh, and the second category of constructivists, I think a lot of people will connect to constructivism Maybe they, uh, maybe they are approaching it in this way, but I find that um, often some, some radical constructivists will think about the facts in isolation and not think about what really makes a true constructivist, which is the connector. Uh, I think I give the example often about building a house. Each building uh, block might be a concept. If we were to stack those up without the mortar, without the glue between, uh, that that house doesn't stand for very long. So we've got to think about what makes those connections. And that's why with experiential, you know, having students go out and experience these concepts uh, in the real world, it's during those experiences, it's uh, traveling to, it's talking to people there, it's seeing things in action. That's the glue that holds these facts together. Uh, I know when I teach environmental chemistry, we always meet outside, we meet on site. Uh, we meet at the water plants, the wastewater plants, the landfills. Uh, because I think these experiences are going to be essential in having them actually figure out uh, the, the concepts. And then one of my favorites is the project base. Uh, this, again, provides them, uh, the students, a lot of uh, abilities to authentically make these connections. And if you're kind of curious, if you want some examples, I have some examples. Uh, I use Crychek's model uh, out of University of Michigan on project base. He basically has these five steps. There's, there's dozens of ways to run a good PBL um, opportunity. Um, I do highly recommend that people you know, have something that, that has been used and kind of research tested. At the same time, this is not something that you wait until the end. I begin my project based day one. Um, I have milestones, benchmarks along the way. Uh, so there's, there's really key attributes that you need to be thinking about if you're going to offer a PBL as an effective andragogical, uh, andragogical method. And for those that haven't seen uh, the competency-based learning, these are some basic attributes that... Um, uh, has been kind of out there and accepted, uh, but these, uh, if you are going to kind of work with these, you need to figure out what those competencies are. Uh, you may or may not want to connect these to grades or points, or uh, sometimes people connect these to what's called mastery learning, and so they, as long as the students can have as many attempts as they'd like until they achieve this. I think that for some activities, these can work well, others maybe not, uh, and so you've got to think about how you might integrate uh, the competency base. Uh, so with that in mind, I would like to take those two major kind of concepts of the methods that I shared in uh, Noel's model of andragogy and, and really kind of think about pace, processing, and sequence. These are things that I find that sometimes people aren't thinking about uh, as much as the content and even the methods. And so, so again, the reason why you're probably here is trying to, uh, to integrate some additions to your teaching. Uh, so fairly recent research by Marzano talks about ways to adjust the pacing. So it isn't just how we're engaging students, um, but how, how often and, and how quickly and, and when are we slowing things down? I think everyone knows a good movie or TV show knows when to speed up and slow down. Uh, so the, the key is this processing time, uh, the first uh, step, which we kind of just mentioned briefly about information processing. So if you would like students to transfer from short term to long term, we need to think about chunking, um, how we can chunk concepts together, how we can give them these little packets that they can take with them, that they can connect in future. And then wait time is also going to be really key. I have to admit it's one of my biggest challenges. Um, typical suggested wait time is three to five seconds when you ask a a question, especially a deeper question, uh, that's very, very hard for me. Um, you can think about what that might mean. It also allows uh, some of the, the students that may not be as, as quick to answer, allows them some time to think and to process uh, so they can give a little bit more uh, thoughtful responses. Uh, group interactions can, can both slow and deepen some of the, uh, the concepts. And I think these are things that you wanna think about if you do have something fairly complex, uh, set the stage, have them work in groups. I find one of the biggest comments that I receive is that uh, this, this is a biggest challenge because just timing alone, you have to be really good with time. You have to develop a, a system. You have to uh, create a kind of a microculture in your class that you're going to go in and out of groups. I, I, would, I recommend having like a timer with a one, two, three minutes. And so they know how to go in and out of the groups. Otherwise, it will take a long time, just logistic of moving people around, getting them to get on task, off task, moving them back. Uh, and so think about that when even when you're thinking about the configuration of your class and if you're going to have people in tables and small groups so that you can do that a little more often. 
Uh, alt, uh, opposite of that is some individual responses. You may want to have students uh, respond individually when you would like things to go a little quicker. Uh, a way to combine these is what's called a jigsaw, which sometimes um, I will have students respond individually and write it down on a post-it note after and, and place it up on the board. And then uh, we'll do a group uh, interaction afterwards, kind of connecting all of those individual responses. So don't think about these as individual approaches, but how you might be able to connect some of these. Informative assessment, uh, SRS is the student response systems. We talked about these extensively with the technology workshop. I'm happy to share some of these with you. Hopefully a few of those uh, aligned with what you wanted to do with your teaching. Uh, these are really powerful ways to do some quick checks, quick checks. Are they with me? Are they with me? Are they not with me? Uh, have some misconceptions for them. Do I need to go back and reteach? Do I need to provide supplemental? Um, office hours, virtual office hours, videos, lots of ways to double and triple check to make sure that they are where they need to be. And all in all, if your pace is not working or you find that things are really being dragged down, I find that sometimes I have some students that do want to talk quite a bit, and I love that. And you can refer them to office hours. Uh, you can talk to them after class. Uh, but a really popular technique is what's called a parking lot. And a parking lot is basically either virtually or real. Uh, you have them write their questions on a post-it note and they park it up on a wall near the door. Uh, I tend to pick those up as I leave and then I'll respond to those in aggregate uh, on a, an LMS announcement or in a group email. This is another concept of uh, methodologies of processing. And I find that a lot of people at first have never heard of this, but in just a few moments, they, they get it. Uh, the concept or the differences between blocking and interleaving. So if you're doing a constructivist methodology, if you're doing um, any method interactively or, or otherwise, uh, you might want to think about uh, at least these two categories of are you teaching one skill at a time? Uh, for instance, in the laboratory, we might teach titration uh, and then we might teach, uh, you know, spectrophotometry or so we might teach each one of these one at a time. There are some concepts. And, and again, hopefully you're thinking about this for what you teach. Some of them will really lend themselves to, to a blocking. I would challenge that many of our concepts though are better taught uh, through what's called interleaving. And this is just a kind of an, an interconnected, uh, interdisciplinary practice that allows students to constantly connect. So instead of just talking about this particular fact in isolation, they get to say, oh, well, I remember seeing this and, and last week or in this prior class or last year or when I was 12 years old or so thinking about how we can ask, uh, access um, and connect the old and the new material, the old and new material. And, and I find that uh, our students come to us with a lot of different backgrounds, allowing them to verbalize, especially in small groups, uh, you kind of capitalize on that background and other people, other students are able to then access those, uh, that background information, even though they may not have themselves had those personal uh, experiences. And the last, and I say this for last, because it's a little of the more complex, sequencing. Now, again, I find that a lot of faculty have, 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 have an approach. Maybe they haven't thought clearly of why they're doing things in certain reasons. Um, often it's because well, that's how they come up in the textbook. Uh, I hope that we're doing a little bit better job than that. Other times we, we skip around the textbook. Um, students are always curious as to why we're doing chapter four and then two and eight and 12. And uh, I hope that you're making that clear, but perhaps with a mental model up front. But thinking about how we're sequencing our methodology is, is going to be really key. Uh, here's a few uh, that you might glance at and start to quickly say, well, I, I, I'd use this or I use this or Maybe I, I take this approach. Often when people think about a teacher um, and teaching, uh, I hear this a lot uh, from non-teaching, non-instructionals is, of course, you want to go from the easy to the difficult. And you want to walk people in uh, the shallow end before you get them swimming. And that's certainly a completely viable way to teach. Uh, it's not the way I teach. <laughs> Uh, and not that I'm any better than anyone else, anyone else. I just find that I tend to do the opposite. I throw them in the deep end and then we unpack concepts throughout the rest of the semester. Uh, a particular specific example, and, and not that mine are any better than yours, but day one, uh, when I'm teaching environmental chemistry, one of the major key components is, is um, basically seeing what's in the ground and the groundwater 
and how we're going to be able to detect what chemicals those are, where they're going, how we clean them up. Uh, and so I'll basically go on a little field trip. Day one, day one, minute one, we walk, we're walking out of the room. I'm carrying a bucket of water. I tell them it's trichloroethene with a partition coefficient of 1100 milligrams per liter. Of course, I realize they have no idea what I'm saying, um, but this is part of it. This is part of the kind of um, scenario that I build. I spill it on the ground. Uh, we build up this case of, you know, where's it going? How are you going to pick this up? And then they start to tell me, uh, well, let's get a vacuum cleaner or let's get a, uh, a leaf blower or let's get. And so, and I'm like, write that down, write that down, write that down. And so we go into the classroom afterwards and they write all their ideas down. And then throughout the rest of the semester, I'm connecting the specific chemical verbiage and vocabulary to their ideas. I'm reminding them that they came up with the ideas. I didn't give it to them. And so now they own those ideas. And, and I'll pick out people's names in particular. And so, you know, they're empowered and they're feeling like, wow, they, they actually knew a bit of this. They didn't even know they knew a bit about this. And so that's just a completely different approach than that linear kind of easy to difficult. Now, I'm not saying that easy to difficult is bad, but I am saying that if it's not well aligned or if there might be a better way, and only you will know that, think about some other ways. Scaffolding, obviously giving them some breadcrumbs and making sure that those breadcrumbs are, are building into something else. And the best way to know if scaffolding is working is you know, prior slide, uh, the, the concept of formative assessment, student response systems, uh, concrete to abstract. Sometimes that's a different approach for second language learners, depending upon where you're teaching and what your uh, background is uh, of, of your students. Um, hierarchical, procedural. The two I want to focus in on are deductive and inductive. Um, deductive is general to specific, and obviously inductive is the opposite. This is something you may want to really think about. Here's a little more extended approach uh, and, and definitions of inductive and deductive. I won't go through too much of the deductive. That is kind of what we call the kind of lecture didactic uh, teacher centered. It's basically where you kind of give them a rule and they complete some task. I tend to, and I think that most uh, people that work with on these workshops have at least considered and occasionally use an inductive method. And this is why they call it a learner centered method is because uh, the learners are basically doing the heavy lifting. It's, it does align well with the inquiry base. Uh, and basically, they're, they're given some thoughts, some ideas, some concepts, maybe physical objects, and they make connections from that. They make their own theories, their own generalizations from that. One of the best examples that I, 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 I recall from this, uh, you may have seen the, it's probably years ago, there was a movie with Tom Hanks uh, about one of the Apollo missions, uh, and they had some problems with their oxygen uh, machine to create that, and uh, so they basically called up Houston and said, you know, we have a problem. And it was a great scene where the engineers down on the earth poured out a bunch of stuff, you know, PVC pipe and tape. And, and they said, here's what they have up there. We need to engineer this so that they can create and fix their problem. Uh, and that was such a really great visual example. And, and I do something, something similar to that in my classes where I'll just give them objects to, to play with, puzzle out, find out. Uh, they, those are the things that they will they remember forever and uh, able to really make some sense of. So, so you might think about kind of your approach if you're taking an inductive uh, or a deductive. And I will say with all of these techniques, there's no reason why you can't be completely transparent with your students. I tell them, hey, we're taking this approach and here's why we're taking this. Uh, it's part of uh, andragogical technique uh, and sharing with them the reasons why. Uh, they actually like to know uh, some of these reasons why. Uh, at this point, some people are thinking about, okay, I understand that, but what are some clear steps? And I won't go through all of these. Um, you can read some of these, I can share some of these, but if you do wanna know more of a step-by-step -step mode for how you can offer an inductive teaching methods, here's some ideas, right? Concepts, gather, students produce questions, refine those, test those. This has some uh, similar uh, approaches to design thinking, ideate, prototype. You've probably seen some of these. Um, and so if you're interested, you can kind of use some of these. I'm happy to talk with you more about it. I'm happy to work with you building it. I'm happy to engage with you while you're uh, providing these to, uh, to your students. I did promise some prompts. If you haven't seen this yet, uh, these are a, a subset. Uh, I'm happy to give you a link to the full set that was done by uh, CSU Fresno. Uh, they basically have a, a nice little table of each of the level of Bloom's taxonomy and how, it, how it's some, uh, some verbs, some active verbs that you might use. So if you are gonna use 
uh, inquiry based. If you are going to take kind of a pedagogical, uh, excuse me, andragogical approach, you might want to think about the questions in the upper brackets in, in red at the minimum, right, to kind of get them into the application analysis. Uh, the most efficient way to approach this, and what I try to do mostly, is the synthetic, the synthesis, is asking those kind of questions tend to generate future questions. Uh, the knowledge and comprehension, again, I try to uh, envelope those, build those into a subset because those tend to uh, bring uh, to some, some finite answers and not, not expand uh, into more uh, divergent conversations. So the bottom line, I'll, I'll share a little of ideas of uh, effective methods will, will do some things. And the, best, the, the biggest thing you probably have to be concerned about is how you're going to triage this content. Because we started by talking about, you know, it's not about coverage, but I don't know about you, when I, I get excited and I start to plan and I'm like, wow, this, this is great stuff. And, and all of a sudden I just add a bunch of stuff and like, this is why we're in, in the business we are, because we think it's all important. And so trying to really triage that to both make sure that you uh, hyper-focus on the outcomes. Uh, and at King, we've got those learning outcomes all very clear uh, for each of our courses. It doesn't mean that you can't create sub-learning outcomes that you think are, are important if they're tangent, uh, additional, not too many, but uh, internal learning outcomes that you think are essential or that help scaffold into those outcomes that, that might be provided. Uh, obviously try to identify these key enduring driving questions, even if you aren't doing project-based, some sort of uh, questions that will always be persistent. I, I, I guarantee you that there's a dozen of those that come to mind uh, for me and for, for you uh, based upon your discipline. They may not come to mind for students now or in the future, and that's kind of one of our goals. And I have this whole kind of dream that I, I meet up with some of my students 10 years from now, and I ask them anything that they've been able to uh, to recall and use uh, from the experiences that we had together. I can't emphasize enough. Uh, I know it feels like it, that we need to get through it all. And I think that we can get through it all. We just may not be, we may not get through it the way we think we should. <laughs> uh, that's why offering these broader uh, questions. And then the key there is obviously trying to find ways to capture and measure uh, what it is that students are able to know, do and believe uh, throughout the course. We can monitor this concept of cognitive load. Uh, and again, a lot of times when we start talking, we think the students can pick it up and they just aren't. Uh, so we can monitor that load with this feedback loop. And that feedback loop could be uh, short term, could be within five minutes, could be within one course session, could be within a week. I hope it's not within a month or the entire class session. And then teaching these process skills, uh, a good andragogical approach. They'll teach the students process skills uh, on how to do this when, when we're gone. And that's the real key. And we can use these targeted methods uh, to address some of these. So there are many, many ways uh, to integrate these. I do have this list of 289 active teaching strategies I shared uh, previously. If you didn't get that, I'm happy to share that link with you uh, so that you can have all of those methods. Those can uh, easily be used as part of your andragogical methods, part of uh, inductive uh, approach, uh, part of if you're looking for ways to make it uh, very uh, fulfilling and, and connective to your students, um, you can use any of those. So that is a wrap up of this session. I am going to stop uh, sharing and stop recording so that you can ask any questions.